good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. I'm delighted to be welcoming Monica Prasad to join us today. So Monica Prasad is professor of sociology at Northwestern University, and she has written four books so far that are all phenomenal, that have won several awards, and they examine the United States and Europe and she's interested in a series of overlapping questions, which are also very close to my heart, the rise of neoliberalism, the various trajectories that different welfare states took, and questions of political economy and what sort of consequences that have for everyday people when it comes to the redistribution of wealth or lack thereof. Of these books that she's written, the first one that I read is also the one that came out first. It came out in 2006. It's called The Politics of Free Markets, The Rise of Neoliberal Economic Policies in Britain, France, Germany, and the United States. And it's just an absolutely sweeping book. It came out with um, Chicago University of Chicago Press. The book makes several arguments, which I won't rehash right now, but I think one core thing that um, Professor Prasad does in this book, which then she also does in her more recent books as well, is challenge some of the everyday explanations and also um, some of the pre-existing scholarly explanations for the rise of free market or neoliberal policies. She looks in particular at this book at how neoliberal policies tend to arise where the political economic structure is adversarial, by which she means where the structure defines labor and capital as adversaries and the middle class and the poor in opposition to one another. And this provides the potential to move the majority of voters towards market-friendly policies. Oops, sorry about that. Um, she's also really interested in this book, therefore, in how, for instance, Thatcher was um, popular in many of the positions that she put forward. And she looks at, among many other things, at the sale of British Telecom and how that changed the meaning of privatization by creating a kind of moral justification for privatization as implementing uh, so-called property owning democracy. After that, that book of 2006, she co-edited a book in 2009 entitled The New Fiscal Sociology, Taxation in Comparative and Historical Perspective with Cambridge University Press. Then in 2012, she published The Land of Too Much, American Abundance and the Paradox of Poverty with Harvard University Press, which was translated in Chinese. In 2018, she published Starving the Beast, Ronald Reagan and the Tax Cut Revolution. And in 2021, a book called Problem Solving Sociology, Oxford University Press. Uh, Professor Prasad has been supported by various prestigious grants and awards and fellowships, including the Fulbright, the National Science Foundation Early Career Development Award, the Guggenheim, and many others. I'm delighted to welcome today and very much look forward to learning from her. Thank you, Monica, for joining us. Thank you. Juliana, for that really uh, lovely introduction. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, this uh, Havens Center seems like uh, exactly the kind of audience that uh, would be uh, the uh, audience, uh, my, my sort of, my dream audience for engaging some of the research that I do. Um, so let me see if we can get the screen share working again. All right. How does that look? Okay. Um, so uh, as, uh, as Juliana mentioned, um, back in 2018, um, I wrote this book called Starving the Beast, um, which is about Ronald Reagan and the tax cut revolution. Um, and then um, after I wrote this book, um, I decided, uh, I decided that I was done studying Republicans, um, at least for a while. Um, I decided I wanted to uh, do other projects. Um, so uh, I moved on. Um, and then in 2021, in January, the cover of my book came true. So uh, back in 2018, um, the idea of an attack on the Capitol existed only in uh, artists' imaginations. So this is an artist's rendering 
of an attack on the Capitol as a metaphor for um, the attack on the state that I was um, studying. Um, and then after uh, the events of the next few years, um, I thought that I really needed to take the story up to the present. Um, so my book really examines this moment in the early 1980s um, and um, kind of stops uh, around the 2000s. Uh, and I thought that I really need to uh, examine what has happened since then and see whether um, some of the things that I argued in the book can shed light on that, especially because there is a lot of talk in the public sphere about whether neoliberalism is related to populism. Is it just uh, another kind of populism, et cetera? So what I'm gonna do in this talk is, um, I will very, very briefly in um, 10 minutes or less um, summarize this book. Uh, and then I'm going to apply some of the ideas of the book to some more recent work uh, about populism. I'm trying to explain uh, the, the rise of populism. So uh, very quickly, uh, the uh, Starting the Beast is a history of the 1981 Economic Recovery Tax Act. Um, this was the famous Laffer Curve tax cut, the supply side tax cut that uh, some, of, uh, some of you may remember and others may have heard of. Um, so this was the tax cut that transformed the Republican Party from the party of balanced budgets to the party of tax cuts. Uh, before this, the Republican Party had been known for insisting on budget balance. Um, the book is based on archival research and various different archives. Um, my argument, uh, just briefly, uh, part of what I uh, argue is uh, is about what isn't causing the tax cut. And that piece I see almost as important as what is causing the tax cut, because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of talk about neoliberalism. There's a lot of kind of loose uh, folk theories about what has caused it. So what I show in the book is that it wasn't really business interests that were behind this big tax cut uh, because business interests feared the deficits that tax cuts would bring. They actually tried to talk Reagan out of doing this. It wasn't race. I do think that the politics of race, um, the Southern strategy, et cetera, gets you to Republicans in office, but I don't think it gets you to neoliberalism. Basically, what I mean by that is that uh, <clears throat> you could have, you could imagine a kind of Nixon-style economic moderation. So Nixon was, of course, um, very um, uh, racially divisive, uh, but but moderate, very moderate in his economic policies. He actually uh, implemented a policy of um, wage and price control. <clears throat> What's also interesting is that if you just look at the shape of public opinion, well, the tax cuts are actually not sailing it for people. Sorry, I don't know why my voice has chosen this moment to suddenly give out. Um, if you follow public opinion at the time, um, people do want tax cuts, but it's very clear that they don't want them at the expense of cutting spending or at the expense of rising deficits. So tax cuts are um, this curious thing. They are popular, but they are not salient by themselves. What's also curious is that, uh, so if it's not exactly the public leading politicians, it's also not politicians leading the public exactly. Uh, so politicians are, uh, the Republicans at this time are budget balancers. So they are not uh, kind of uh, implementing this uh, out of nowhere. They have to change dramatically as a result of um, some of these. So then what does happen? What I argue in the book uh, is that if you examine it comparatively, the US is very unusual for having an economy in which consumption is uh, uh, very important. Um, this is not something that is just an outcome of um, American culture. In fact, it's something that starts in the post-war period. Um, and so the US, as I have talked about another work, uh, is this consumer uh, economy, whereas other countries, the European countries, focus much more on uh, exports, on producing for export. One aspect of this consumer economy was uh, relatively low taxes on consumption. 
and relatively higher taxes on income, profit, and capital gains, um, as you see here. So just a difference in tax structure. Um, and what I take great pains to show in the book is that um, this kind of tax structure was more sensitive to inflation, the great inflation of the 1970s. Um, so this is basically showing you that different categories of tax um, uh, evolved differently under uh, under the inflation. Um, so if you uh, look at property and payroll taxes uh, as a percent of GDP, they don't actually change so much as a result of um, inflation, um, nor does TGS as the tax on goods and services. It's a kind of uh, sales tax, consumption tax that the other countries have. What does rise is social security tax and uh, particularly income profit capital gains tax. So you remember that the US was unusually dependent on income profit capital gains tax. And this is the kind of tax that is most sensitive to the great infl inflation. So this is rising. This, uh, I argue, is part of why you are um, seeing people saying that taxes are too high in the U.S. And this is Gallup and GSS data. Uh, early 19, uh, 19 that we're talking about, um, most people were saying that their taxes were too high. Um, and in fact, you can predict public opinion on taxes too high with just a very few objective variables. GDP, uh, growth in GDP, inflation, and the tax burden. Um, uh, uh, the the uh, blue line is what uh, people actually say about whether their taxes are too high, and the red line is a prediction made of these four factors. So in short, uh, this uh, tax structure that was more vulnerable to inflation was leading people to say that their taxes were too high. All right, so far so good. Um, I've said that there's a consumption-oriented economy in the U.S., which leads to the greater weight of direct taxes on the tax structure. These are more sensitive to, uh, to inflation. And I said that there, th this, leads, uh, this leads to uh, a mobilizable political opportunity. However, what I also mentioned is that the public didn't actually prefer tax cuts if they came at the costs of spending or deficits. But, <clears throat> so there is a second factor without which we wouldn't have seen the tax cuts. And that's what was going on within the Republican Party. So this is the Republican Party's record over the last century or so. Um, so blue bars represent Democrats uh, having control of uh, the House on the top and the Senate on the bottom. Um, and this long stretch of blue is what the Republicans were facing. So 1981 is right around here. Um, and uh, they had been out of power for almost an unbroken stretch of 40 years. 1981 is also very soon after um, Watergate. And the Republicans were very worried about that. Uh, you find them saying things like, Nixon is likely to kill us for the next 40 years the way Hoover has killed us for the past 40 years. This was a quote from 1975. In 1974, um, you see a Republican um, a poster saying, after the latest shellacking, this was a Republican midterm losses in 1974, who can even imagine a Republican Congress being elected in our lifetime or perhaps in our children's lifetime? This is 1974. Um, so what I, uh, what I basically argue is that there's this macro structure, reliance on progressive taxes and inflation, which leads to this political opportunity to mobilize tax cuts. And then there are Republicans who are desperately looking for an issue to mobilize. And this is why you get one faction in the party offering tax cuts. So um, uh, it was also, by the way, very successful. Um, if you look before this time, this uh, question says, looking ahead for the next few years, which political party do you think will do a better job of keeping the country prosperous, the Republican Party or the Democratic Party? From 1951 until Ronald Reagan, um, Americans think it's the Democratic Party that's going to keep them more prosperous. Um, at some points, a 30 percentage point divide. After Reagan, it's pretty even. They trade their lead back and forth. Um, so this focus on tax cuts has been remarkably effective for the Republican Party um, in this um, in this in this way.
Um, so what I want to do today is apply some of the ideas of the book to the era of populism. And especially I want to apply this specific piece about uh, the autonomous role of politics, the, um, the incentives for politicians to mobilize particular issues. And I'm going to talk about them in the context of populism. So to start with, uh, I argue that various explanations um, of populism that we that are popular are unsatisfying or incomplete. Uh, so it's common to hear that populism is a result of globalization or of neoliberalism or of the hollowing out of the middle class. And I, I do think that there's something to that, as, as you'll see. But it's an incomplete explanation because we have to answer why the response takes this populist form um, rather than say a socialist or social democratic one. I mean, if the problem is globalization, in one sense, the answer is pretty easy, which is just address the problems caused by globalization. So for example, if the problem is free trade, um, you uh, would have worker retraining programs or things like that. Um, but uh, the populists are voting against the parties that are trying to address these problems. So uh, there's something else that needs to be uh, uh, addressed there. Uh, is it immigration? One of the things that we see when we look across countries are that countries that have similar rates of immigration see different degrees of populism. So absolutely, immigration is part of the story, but there's something else in the story that's going on. Is it technological changes? You know, so is it social media has just driven everyone crazy? Um, but uh, technological changes you see everywhere. Populism you don't see everywhere. And um, the technologies have uh, seemed to lead to extremism on the right more than on the left. So for example, you don't see a violent communist fringe in America today. You know, if it were just that technology is allowing people to um, reinforce their beliefs in these little bubbles, you would see a, a, a lot of um, uh, 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 these kinds of extreme, extremist tendencies on the, on the right as well. Uh, sorry, on the left as well. So um, I don't say that these uh, these different explanations are, uh, I don't think we could throw them out, but I do think they're incomplete. Um, and what I'm gonna argue today is about the autonomous role of politics and having brought us here. So uh, in particular, my argument is that the rise of right-wing populism is partly the result of the rise of redistributor preferences since the 1990s, um, partly because of the financial crisis of 2007 to eight, but even before that, free market policies had been losing support among such uh, among some dimensions. Um, before that, these free market policies were popular with many constituencies around the globe. Uh, because of the rise, because the rise of redistributive preferences leads some right wing parties to leave to lose voters. It leaves them searching for alternative ways of mobilizing voters. Uh, basically, as free market platforms have lost appeal, conservative parties have either actively mobilized racist or xenophobic themes, or they have been unable to resist parties on their right flank who have done so. Um, ironically, socialist and social democratic positions have not made, made much headway, despite rising support for redistribution because that support has strengthened mainstream parties of the left that have offered more cautious and incremental redistributive policies, uh, which continue to generate support. So uh, basically, I'm going to try, to try to show you the steps of this uh, argument. Uh, so first, um, this is uh, European values survey data. Basically, the European values survey asks five questions that allow us to examine uh, redistributive preferences over time. Uh, so the questions are, um, do we need larger income differences as incentives or should incomes be made more equal? Um, private ownership of business should be increased or government ownership of business should be increased. Um, sometimes there's a, a slight variation in how they ask the question, ownership, business and industry. 
Um, the next one is individuals or people should take more responsibility for providing for themselves or a state or government should take more responsibility to ensure that everyone is provided for. People who are unemployed should have to take any job available. People who are unemployed should have the right to refuse a job they do not want. Competition is good. It stimulates people to work hard, develop new ideas. Competition is harmful. It brings out the worst in people. Um, I recoded some of the questions so that the neoliberal position is uh, is lower. So lower numbers indicate more neoliberalism. And basically what you see is that, um, so in all five of these areas, there has been an increase in redistributive preferences. In all five of these, the increase is statistically significant. Um, in some of these questions, it's quite large. Um, so in some of them, it's uh, it's a fairly small increase. So um, uh, with uh, the right to refuse a job or uh, government responsibility for taking care of people, it's a you know it's, it's a fairly small increase. Um, if you examine uh, this question of government ownership, uh, government ownership of business should be increased. That's a quite dramatic increase. So it's well over one um, one point on a, on a on a ten point scale. Um, and then there are a couple of these which uh, which uh, increased uh, and then declined a little bit. So um, a competition is good or harmful, and uh, also this. Uh, 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 should incomes be made more equal? The peak of this was right around the financial crisis, and then it, since then it's declined um, a little bit. So um, these redistributive preferences, I argue, um, upset the equilibrium for some right-wing political parties. Um, and specifically, it's uh, if if this argument is uh, is correct, um, then it should be right-wing political parties that are more neoliberal, um, that will feel the need to turn to xenophobic appeals. Uh, so uh, if uh, they don't otherwise have a strong and politically resonant platform, then the waning of neoliberalism should see xenophobia rising in these uh, political parties. So in short, the political parties that were more neoliberal should be the ones that are more xenophobic today. So to examine this, I used a comparative uh, um, uh, party manifesto data. This is a, a, a European data set. And I created a neoliberalism index and a xenophobia index. So just to give you the, the things that make up the, uh, the index. So there are some of these uh, questions. What the, what the comparative uh, party manifesto data set does is um, it examines every party manifesto or basically every communication from a party that is making a claim as to why you should vote for that party. They then um, code it sentence by sentence. Every sentence gets exactly one code, no more than one and no less than one. So you can add and subtract the, the, the codings. Um, and um, basically, they code it according to various categories. So is the sentence uh, giving, for example, a favorable mention of the free market, a favorable mention of supply side economic policies, um, uh, negative uh, on protectionism, uh, et cetera. Um, and then um, uh, I also, so I added the positive values here and subtracted the negative values. So if the manifesto is saying something positive about nationalization, for example, then it's less neoliberal. Um, similarly, uh, I did a coding of uh, the xenophobia of these um, platforms. So the positive values here are negative uh, mentions of multiculturalism, uh, uh, positive uh, mentions of the national way of life and things like immigration being a threat to, to national character, and subtracted um, some of these uh, these uh, negative values. So multi a positive mention to multiculturalism would be subtracted. Um, favorable references to underprivileged minorities, et cetera, would be subtracted. Okay, so um, that's the uh, neoliberalism index and the xenophobia index. And um, there you do see a correlation between the two. So parties that were more neoliberal in the neoliberal era, um, which I took in this one to be 1980 to 2006, although I did a little bit of robustness testing with the dates as well, um, and you don't see a change. So parties that were more neoliberal in the neoliberal era 
are more xenophobic in the popular stereo. It's basically what this argument um, is, is, is saying. Um, specifically, the parties that uh, are very high on xenophobia, you see are more towards the um, right uh, of the chart. Um, and uh, uh, this is a uh, this is true uh, even if you control for party sentiment. So you might think, well, aren't right-wing parties always more xenophobic and more neoliberal? But even if you control for um, whether it's uh, what, what kind of party it is, ecological, socialist, social democratic, liberal, Christian democratic, conservative, national security, et cetera, um, you do find this relationship. Um, I also controlled for stocks and flows of migration. Um, so, um, so th there's this basic correlation here, but um, nothing here tells us um, why we actually have this, right? So um, what I do next uh, in the paper is um, I talk specifically about um, what happened uh, in the US. Um, so uh, I've, uh, I've, I've argued that um, various uh, strategies uh, brought tax cut onto the agenda. Um, so uh, what happened after Reagan uh, is uh, equally important to try to understand this. Um, so you see here uh, uh, with Ronald Reagan's uh, tax cut, the one that I was talking about in 81. Uh, so it uh, does uh, decrease the top the, the tax rate for the top quintile, um, as well as for the next several quintiles, and um, it increases the tax rates for the bottom quintiles. Before he leaves office, though, Reagan backtracks on this uh, and increases tax rates um, for the top quintile a little bit. Um, so um, after Reagan, George W. Bush is uh, not doing very much to change this one way or the other. He does increase um, taxes to, to, to close the, the deficit. Um, uh, you uh, really see a big increase when uh, Bill Clinton gets in. So this is the, the Clinton increase on the top quintile. And then you see a big decline for the top quintile as well as for all the quintiles under George W. Bush. Um, and then during the financial crisis, the tax rates fall a little bit further. Um, overall, what I want to point out is that uh, the tax rates for the bottom four quintiles have actually been declining. So throughout this period that we think of as the period of tax cuts, taxes have been cut, but uh, they have, uh, because they've been cut substantially for um, the the bottom four quintiles, the tax structure has uh, actually gotten more progressive. Um, and this is the case even if you examine uh, the um, the share of income as a ratio of uh, share of income to share of taxes paid. Um, that has not actually changed for the top quintiles, and it's gotten a little bit better for the bottom quintiles. Um, so the reason for this is when Republicans come into office, they cut taxes on everyone. Um, this is what George W. Bush was doing, for example. Um, and then when Democrats come into office, they leave the tax cuts in place for the bottom quintiles, and they raise taxes on the wealthy. So you have this overarching decline in tax rates combined with fluctuating taxes on the top quintile. That's the basic picture. Um, so um, uh, very quickly, um, after Reagan, uh, the next Republican president, George H.W. Bush, um, famously does not cut taxes. Uh, and pays for it. So you know, he had um, gotten into office with this uh, dramatic um, and, uh, dramatic um, uh, phrase. He said, read my lips, no new taxes. And then he actually did increase taxes in order to uh, close the deficit. Um, and many Republicans argued that he paid for it. He lost uh, re-election in 1992. So in the 1990s, uh, the Republican Party Partly because, uh, partly because Reagan had, had done this, but also especially because of Bush's loss, decides 
that tax cuts are the way to go. Um, so in 1996, um, Republican Bob Dole campaigns on the platform of a big Reagan-esque tax cut and doesn't win. And you could have interpreted his loss as showing that the issue of tax cuts had limited potential. Instead, a Republican activist drew the lesson. The problem was that Dole was offering tax cuts ever after having spent a lifetime raising taxes. Um, so he was the wrong messenger, is the conclusion that they drew. Um, it's not enough to simply offer tax cuts. You have to have a track record of implementing them. And this is why in the late 1990s, you start to see governors around the country suddenly racing each other to cut taxes. Uh, Christine Todd Whitman starts this off. And then George W. Bush, the governor of Texas, does this as well um, and takes it to the White House. Um, so uh, uh, George W. Bush is um, uh, making these uh, these uh, these dramatic uh, tax cuts um, here that um, have had this kind of ironic effect. Um, and these tax cuts are very, very popular. They are part of what make George W. Bush uh, the, um, the the president who is actually most responsive to the concerns of the public, according to um, the work of Martin Gillens, um, including the preferences of the poor. The poor want tax cuts, uh, and uh, this is what um, this is what uh, Bush gives them. Um, so, uh, a, a, an odd feature of all of this is that. Um, as tax pro progressivity has risen and as the burdens of taxation on the bottom four quintiles have fallen, um, Americans in general have become less concerned about taxation. So I showed you this figure earlier and I concentrated then on this part of it, um, the people saying taxes are too high and tax burdens are too high. But the rest of the story is that um, over the next several decades, the tax burden falls and people's worries about taxation also fall. Um, so reaching some of the lowest uh, points since we since the series started. So tax opposition is falling uh, among the, the public. Um, so uh, in other words, this um, Republican attempt to actually realize their tax cut agenda undermines their agenda. Um, people are no longer voting for the Republican Party simply because of tax cuts. And the tax cut of 2017 is an example of this. This was the first tax cut that actually wasn't popular among the public. Um, so, you know, George W. Bush had passed this tax cut that was skewed towards the wealthy and um, found great electoral resonance for that. Donald Trump passes a tax cut in 2017 that is skewed towards the wealthy. This tax cut is not popular at all. So tax cuts um, are losing their appeal. Um, and I argue that this is why uh, the Republican Party uh, is uh, desperately looking for new issues to mobilize. It has sort of um, destroyed its own political niche by realizing that political niche. Um, so just uh, very quickly to um, include, um, first of all, I want to apologize that this uh, paper is in such an unfinished state, even just putting it together over the last few weeks for this talk. Um, I realized a few things that I that I need to do. Um, one is that I know that I need to go country by country, maybe even party by party in the European value survey instead of just sharing a broad um, overarching uh, trend. Um, the other thing I need to do is uh, have a good answer for why xenophobia rather than other issues. So um, I've examined the polls. If you were a Republican um, party, party member trying to mobilize an issue, one thing that you would really try to mobilize is opposition to gun control. If you're just following the polls, that is the thing that... Um, it seems Republicans are most excited about. Uh, they do not want gun control. Um, but instead, we get xenophobia and we get transgender sort of issues being mobilized. Um, so I don't have a, a, a good answer to that. Nevertheless, I do think that there are some conclusions and implications that we can take away, even just from what I've um, showed you so far. Um, so one is that uh, 
parties that lose their free market appeals uh, find themselves in this fraught situation. Um, that uh, this rise in redistribution leaves them um, without something with uh, with uh, something that's not resonating with voters. Um, and so this is a line of argument that um, resonates with the work that Daniel Ziblatt has recently done about the origins of um, of, uh, of authoritarianism in um, in Germany and uh, lack of authoritarianism in Britain in, in the 19, um, 1930s. So he basically argues that um, reconciling conservative parties with democracy is a key to upholding democracy. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, I argue that if conservative parties can't be successful in normal democratic politics, there's a danger that they will mobilize populism. Um, I also want to suggest that uh, neoliberalism in America, by giving conservative parties something that did resonate with voters, was a four decade long distraction from the politics of race. So Nixon style racial grievance was a path that the party did not have to go down because they did have this very popular politics of tax cuts. Now that that politics of tax cuts has waned, we are back to the politics of race. Um, and uh, then um, I want to uh, uh, suggest this, uh, this this odd observation that ri a rise in preferences for redistribution to a rise in xenophobia. Um, and I don't think you can explain that with society-centric kinds of arguments. It's only really explicable by this state-centered argument, which is the role of parties. Um, so um, a few implications to close with. Uh, so um, one is that, uh, well, what can we do about populism, right, about this? Um, so one is that many conservative part, uh, parties around the world have actually made their peace with the welfare state. Um, as we saw, not all conservative parties are neoliberal. Well, and so some of them could compete not to reduce spending, but to turn it in particular directions, for example, to channel it, channel it to their own constituents. Um, another way to think about how populism can, um, can, can be defeated um, is that free market appeals might actually become more resonant at a further remove from the financial crisis. Um, or if progressive parties succeed in rising in raising tax rates in the middle classes, or if rising interest rates make debt payments more difficult. And this could promote free market factions within conservative parties over populist factions. Um, third, uh, if one element keeping populism alive is the need of politicians to find issues that resonate, this analysis suggests that addressing economic or racial grievances may not actually address populism, as parties looking for new issues will find new grievances to mobilize, and they might even create new grievances around peripheral issues. Finally, and most importantly, if populism is at least part, partly about whether conservative parties find other platforms to campaign on, the populist temptation will always be present for a party that has exhausted other appeals. It may be the case that populist impulses can't be permanently defeated, but only repeatedly diverted. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, uh, Monica. Please, everyone, join me in a round of applause for Monica's wonderful presentation. We will now move to the Q&A portion of today's event. So I'm in the library at the moment, so I can't quite turn on my camera. But um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, so I wanted to ask a question, um, and I'll, I'll just embellish the question that I sent you. Um, but does your focus on tax cuts, especially in the consideration to your Trump's, the, the comments on Trump, which I found to be very interesting, totally um, uh, um, a theme for another talk, but the, the lack of popularity on that issue and uh, Trump's utilization of it, um, does this, Beg the question of contextual factors that made the made tax cuts not popular. It's not necessarily, perhaps, like you said, that tax cuts wasn't a popular issue. It's just um, the usage of populism uh, negated, let's say, tax cuts uh, potency, like political potency, because there were other more pressing issues. Um, 
And does this factor into your research, the, the, the surrounding uh, context that makes tax cuts more popular than other issues? Um, and also, you mentioned spread at the very ending, but this idea that populism can be used to mask or obfuscate more pressing issues when, um, when a party is under uh, duress, like you mentioned. Yeah, no, that's a fascinating question. Um, I hadn't actually thought about whether the causation could be the other way around. Does populism lead to less popularity for tax cuts? I mean, um, offhand, my sense is that it's those objective factors driving it. I, I just personally, I'm um, just startled by how tight the prediction actually is. You know, if you just take GDP and GDP growth and inflation and the tax burden, you can predict uh almost exactly what people are gonna say about whether taxes are too high. Um, the other reason I'm not sure if it's actually populism driving the popularity of tax cuts is that you see the decline of popularity of tax cuts before the rise of populism. Um, so, um, you know, so uh, it, this, this trend is happening even before there. I mean, I, I don't have the smoking gun evidence yet. The smoking gun evidence would be um, Republicans saying, tax cuts are no longer working, we need to mobilize racism. Um, that kind of evidence is um, hard to find. I don't know if it would even be preserved in the archives, that kind of, you know, that kind of talk. Um, it might because, you know, you see uh, politicians or we've seen recently activists talking about um, responding to uh, grievances in terms of like respect, you know, so you could see something like um, we need to respect our public, they are upset about immigration, right? So if I could find the archival document that puts these things together, you know, saying tax cuts are not popular, therefore we need to um, move to immigration. I don't actually think that's, that's, that's what happened within the Republican Party. I think it was more that, um, the people who were promoting tax cuts found themselves no longer being able to get into office. So Bobby Jindal is an example of this, right? So he thinks I'm going to follow the George W. Bush playbook. I'm going to make this dramatic tax cut in Louisiana, which he does, devastates Louisiana. Um, so I'm going to make this dramatic tax cut and that'll get me into higher office. Um, it gets him no traction at all. Um, you know, he's he's on the undercard in, the, in that those debates, right? Um, and instead, the people who are getting traction are the people who are making these, these populist appeals. So, um, so I think it's more that kind of uh, dynamic. But um, yeah, thank you for these, uh, uh, this, this, this question. It's very, it's very uh, butt provoking. The floor is open. Uh, thank you very much, John. Who else would like to ask a question or offer a comment? Lauren Peabody, please go ahead. Hi, Monica. Thanks so much for your presentation. That was that was fantastic. Um, I was curious about your explanation of, of that turning point when the Republicans shifted from the party of balanced budgets to the party of tax cuts. And, and I take it that was uh, early 80s under um, Reagan. And I'm wondering, how do you see the, uh, the Volcker shock playing a role there? Because obviously that happened under Carter, who then paid a price for it. But then uh, the the really contractionary monetary policy was continued under um, Reagan, which is then creating this very painful recession. Do you do you kind of need some other uh, more populist uh, economic um, message like tax cuts to kind of uh, compensate for that? Do, do you think there or or just how do you see the role of the Volcker shock? Um, in yeah, that? it's it's um. Super complicated because um, Reagan does have this big tax cut in '81. It creates deficits. He immediately backs off from the tax cut in '82. He passes this huge tax increase. Um, so um, it's uh, you know one of the reasons that he is remembered as the um, origin of tax cuts is that. Um, the tax increase doesn't close the deficit. He's also increasing military spending at this time, therefore deficits skyrocket. And then, ironically, the fact that his tax cut failed 
is what shows Republicans that they should do tax cuts because deficits skyrocket and and the sky doesn't fall down. Um, so, you know, first of all, uh, they discovered that they can finance deficits, that there are plenty of uh, investors around the globe who are willing to finance American deficits, right? And so it doesn't really have an effect on the economy, which wasn't clear before then. When um, when people discover that it doesn't have an effect on the economy, voters also do not punish uh, politicians who are um, who are uh, producing deficits, right? So you know, in fact, quite the opposite. They punish George H. W. Bush for trying to close the deficit, um, and the Republican Party, for this reason, kind of switches from being the party of budget balance to being the party of tax cuts. Not because of the success of Reagan's tax cut, but because of its failure. Um, how the Volcker shop plays into it. Uh, so one thing is, I think that um, in Republican myth, uh, Reagan is credited with defeating inflation. Um, you know, so uh, uh, enter Republican voters. Uh, if you look at the the the, the um, polling and why, especially working class voters in the '70s are saying that they are um, uh, choosing. Reagan over Carter, it's because they're very frustrated with Carter's economy. And they, they associate this uh, new economy of lower inflation and eventually better uh, job growth with Reagan. So, um, yeah, so uh, so it's, it's complicated. I don't think it's quite, I don't think it's exactly that um, Reagan needed um, this populist policy because of um, because of the because of inflation while he was president. However, I do think that that's exactly what's going on when he's campaigning. You know, he's saying um, though it's not quite clear yet that uh, that the Volcker truck is going to work. Um, so Reagan is saying, "I've got this other answer to inflation, which is tax cuts, which are going to make." producers so productive that you will have a lot more goods and therefore you won't have too much money chasing too few goods. That's basically supply side economics, right? So yeah, it's a very complicated answer to your question. Thanks so much for that, Lauren. Juliana. Thanks for this brilliant talk, Monica. So I learned I learned a lot from you and I have many questions. I'll try to limit myself to two. One is to just hear a little bit more about whether you see yourself as pushing back against, let's say, a position that's very much available out there in in the general public and that has been also, you know, been corroborated by some surveys having to do with the declining importance of what everyday voters want and how political parties make their preferences and their their policy recommendations. So I'm just wondering, you know, you brought up the gun control example, which is one, but there are clearly many other examples as well. So I'm just curious to hear you reflect a little bit more on whether and how you see economics as an exception, economic policy as a potential exception to that role. And then the other question that I had has to do with Trump. And, you know, yes, on the one hand, he he certainly put in place um, tax cuts that benefited the, the, the super wealthy. On the other hand, Trump, I think, can be read at, as advancing a new old kind of economics that's basically welfare chauvinism, right? The, the, uh, he, it was very important for him to say that he wasn't going to break with the existing weak but present um, welfare state that the United States has, um, but that he would limit it to, you know, those who really deserve it, et cetera. Um, and that's not really anything new under the sun historically, right? I mean, welfare chauvinism is is a well-established um, norm of welfare states uh, that, that that we've seen throughout history in the 20th century and into the 21st. So I'm just curious what you make of that. And, and I feel like that would somehow impact your argument about xenophobia, because if welfare chauvinism is a form of economic policymaking and, an, and a model that's out there, um, it, it kind of carries within it xenophobia. It's not necessarily anything you know, that it doesn't generate xenophobia. It itself 
is defined by it and embodies it through, again, the policy choices that that it makes. So anyway, I was just curious to hear you reflect on those two things. Thank you so much. So one on the declining responsiveness, are you referring to like Ben Page and Martin Gillins? Yeah, so that research is a pet peeve for me because I think they present it completely incorrectly. Um, so uh, if you actually examine what they're showing in their data, um, one thing they're showing, and they're clear about this in the articles, but they're not clear about this when they you know, write about it in the public, um, is that Republicans are the ones who are responsive to the public. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the um, things that Gillen finds in his book, he says, he, or, 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 let's examine which, um, which presidents are more and least responsive to the public, right? Um, and he finds that Lyndon Johnson is uh, the least responsive and George W. Bush is the most responsive. Um, so uh, one of the things that is... Um, Driving this is uh, preferences on social and cultural values. So, uh, for example, um, also, by the way, not just that Republicans are most responsive to the public, the Republicans are most responsive to the poor. And George W. Bush was most responsive to the poor. So one of the things that's driving this is preferences on social and cultural values, obviously abortion, um, things like um, stem cell research, um, surveillance of uh, Muslim Americans, so uh, what makes the Democrats less responsive to the poor and what is raising those figures uh, of less responsiveness to the public in general is that Democrats are not willing to uh, put wiretaps on Muslim Americans, for example. That's one example that's in there. Um, so uh, the other aspects that are making George W. Bush um, one of the presidents who was most responsive to the poor is that the Iraq war was very popular. Um, his tax cuts were very popular. There's this big debate about what does that actually mean? Was he misleading the public, you know, et cetera. But um, if you're just talking about responsiveness to what the public wants, uh, it's the Republican Party that is, uh, that's, that, that's most responsive um, to what the public wants. Um, I also, in the most re recent book in Starving the Beast, um, I uh, break this down for um, economic policies uh, in particular. Um, and there are definitely some areas where Republicans are not responsive to uh, what uh, the public wants and what uh, voters want. And what I show is that in comparative perspective, these are things where the US is much more progressive than Europe. Um, so these are things where um, you know business interests are with the, uh, the other uh, uh, parts of the coalition that are pushing this are, I call it running to stay in place. So they're having to exert all of this effort to get outcomes that uh, in Europe um, you find without them having to exert all of this effort. So um, yeah, so I find that whole line of uh, of uh, argument. Um, I mean, the, the research is fine. The way they present the research is pure demagoguery, um, I, I find. Um, so, um, yeah, welfare chauvinism is a super interesting question. Um, so one, one thing I did is um, I tried to examine, well, when does this correlation between um, xenophobia and neoliberalism, when does it um, start? And you do not see it before 2006. So there is actually this welfare chauvinism um, in, the, in, the, in the World Guidance Survey in the parties before then, you know, so that um, some of the parties that uh, are... Um, less neoliberal, you know, sort of uh, more welfare oriented are the ones that are the um, the, the, the more uh, xenophobic. Um, you start to see this correlation starting in 2006, which is when you sort of um, get this more kind of uh, role uh, issue of, um, of uh, neoliberal parties kind of losing their platform and then turning, turning towards this. Yeah, and Trump is also super interesting because um, you know, he uh, he kind of he took Social Security and Medicare off the table um, to such an extent that now um, all Republicans have taken it off the table. You know, so um, what they were heckling President Biden for was he said Republicans want to cut Social Security and Medicare, some of them, and so they they so disagreed with this that they heckled him over over this, and so he 
um, got them all to stand up and say, we all promise not to cut Social Security and Medicare. So now that has, all of that has been taken off the table. And of course, the irony of this is that um, Ronald Reagan got his start in politics arguing against Medicare. You know, he thought it was going to lead us to socialism. Um, George W. Bush tried to privatize Social Security in the 2000s. Um, Paul Ryan became the vice presidential candidate because he had this plan to uh, to to, to um, cut Medicare. But now the Republican Party, because of Donald Trump, has taken cuts in Social Security and Medicare off the table, which is why they can't balance the budget. But that's another issue. Thank you so much for that, Juliana. Uh, a question in the chat from Peter B. Um, is it perhaps a clarifying question, Monica? On a neoliberalism scale of one to 10, were you to construct one, where would you place the Clinton administration versus uh, the George W. Bush administration? I mean, so definitely the Clinton administration is neoliberal, right? So this is the time when the Democrats are thinking free market policies are the are the way to go. Um, they're not as neoliberal as George W. Bush, especially because of the tax cuts that follow. So um, where would I place them on a scale? That's hard to say, but definitely Bush is higher on that scale than Clinton is. Um, Although he also is, um, you know, he's not moving in the xenophobic direction, you know, partly because he's got this this, this alternative to, to push. I'm also seeing this. Wonderful. Oh, do you have another question in the chat directed to you? Yeah, from Chanita. Yes. Please go ahead and take that question. If you would, uh, Chanita, would you mind reading out your question? Okay. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Could you elaborate more on what factors contribute to the populist economic system or policy that will base on the population who are the major contributors to the U.S. economy, uh, for example, migrants, African-American, and working class people. Thank you. I'm not sure I completely understood the question. Uh, what factors will contribute to changing the e economic system, which may contribute to the majority of the, because you talk about the populist economic system, right? Which, which I think uh, rarely we found that they, I mean, engage with the, the real people, like the, the major contributors due to like a kind of like xenophobic or racism. Yeah, so I mean, the people who, we are being xenophobic against are precisely the people who are the major contributors to the American economy, right? Um, uh, African Americans and migrants. Um, that's your. That, that, that's the. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, it's it's a it's 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 an, it's an interesting line of thinking. Um, you know, it suggests that could populism eventually just uh, economically exhaust itself? You know, I mean, if you were if you are completely um, against the people who are making up your system, um, yeah, I think we kind of we we saw a little bit of this during the um, coronavirus crisis when suddenly people like um, uh, undocumented farm workers we suddenly realized that these are essential to the economy and you know uh, that uh, the economy doesn't actually continue to function without them. I mean, I think that. Um, I think there's, what's the phrase? There's a lot of ruin in an economy. I think that politics can override economic rationality, definitely. So I think that there is a lot of ruin possible in the economy. Thank you so much for that, Shanita. Uh, next, we'll go to Pete Roman. Pete. Uh, firstly, thanks very much for a really interesting talk. Um, I really enjoyed that. I wanted to ask you about a couple of European cases um, and about how they fit into your analysis. Um, firstly, I know you've, when you've been doing this presentation before, you've um, engaged with the topic of Brexit, and I can really see how this fits into the story you're telling. But I'd be interested to hear you share some of your thoughts on it. Um, and also, I'd just be interested, um, will that case be uh will feature will that feature in the eventual paper or is it something you're thinking about dropping and i was just interested in your thinking about that and the second case i wanted to ask you about is france because i think it's very interesting and because it could complicate it, the story a little bit 
Macron's agenda is very explicitly neoliberal um, with pension reform and opposition to it. That's in the news a lot recently. So it doesn't necessarily fit precisely with the the measure and operate, operationalizations you're using. But I think Macron's an interesting case for the study of populism because he's a champion of centrist liberalism. He positions himself against xenophobia, the xenophobia of the far right, and partly bases his moral legitimacy on this. But discursively and stylistically, he borrows a lot from populism. He launched a new party to challenge what he described as a corrupt and outdated political establishment. He uses populist language to criticize trade unions and so on. So does this present any complications for the implications of your thesis? Or does it just suggest that Macron will face pressure to embrace xenophobia? Yeah, I know that's a fabulous thought. I actually think that you just kind of wrote the paper. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, but yeah, no, I, 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 I do, I do think that that's a. I don't think that I don't think Macron, Macron and um, Le Pen fit this frame well because Le Pen is welfare chauvinist um, instead of the this, this issue. I'm not, so I'm not exactly sure um, how to how to how to think through um, think through that one. But um, yeah, no, I think you suggest this really interesting way to uh, reconcile that, which is the sort of style of populism without the substance mm. of populism. So it's a, an interesting thought. Um, yeah, I do think that one thing I'm going to have to do in the paper is go country by country and kind of show where is the strongest, where is this weakest, which countries does it apply to, which doesn't it apply to. Um, and you had a, a second question. Sorry, I didn't write it down. What was it? Uh, it was just on Brexit. Um... Oh, yeah, Brexit. Yeah, no, I decided to I dropped that because I made that a whole different paper because it was just uh, <laughs> the whole question is just so interesting and uh, fascinating. So um, so Brexit, you know, is, is the, the, the case where um, populism has really been most influential, right? In all of these other countries, you can take back some of the populist policies. You can't take back Brexit. I mean, I... You know, they pinned their start to this, um, and now they regret it. Now the majority says it was a it was a mistake. Um, so I do show um, some of these dynamics here, and there's this really interesting. The reason I made it a completely different paper is that there's this really strange thing that happens um, uh, is that um, the populist moment, the 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 preference for Brexit, um, kind of rises in four days um, right after the um, 2015 election. So I get into this long social psychological thing about um, why are they, so th this is the piece, you know, so I said, I don't have a really good um, explanation for um, why populism rather than other things. Um, and so this was an attempt to sort of try to answer that question. So there is a way in which the, um, election of 2015 kind of channels concern onto um onto the onto the issue of Europe. Um Europe had not been um uh, 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 an issue that was uh of much concern um until 2015 and then suddenly it just skyrockets and you know the next year they're out of the they're um, they're Brexiting, right? Um, so um, it's the social psychology thing that I try to show about um, how you choose one thing rather than another. It's about it's not about your beliefs, but it's about your beliefs in other people's beliefs. So what you think other people are thinking, um, and that's actually a question of information. And beliefs don't change rapidly, but information can change rapidly according to various institutional constraints, et cetera. So maybe I'll present that paper next time. <laughs> Thank you so much for the questions, Pete. Myra Marks Ferry has uh, written uh, some questions into the chat, but Myra, you've also turned on your camera. Would you like to speak to your question? I ask you to unmute if you would like to pose it to Monica yourself. Sure. <clears throat> sure. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk and I enjoyed thinking about the intertwining of both populist and racist themes with Republican failures to get a certain kind of tax cut ball rolling. But at the same time, I'm very struck by how the discussions of race and race politics leave aside why gender politics has suddenly jumped to the top 
of the agenda and why going all the way back to Reagan, you have the Republican Party realigning against abortion rights um, with Phyllis Schlafly in an anti-feminist direction, uh, leading to active women Republicans from the mainstream defecting way back then from the Republican Party. And the Republican Party is moving in this direction that sanctifies family relations in a certain kind of quote unquote traditionality into which of course race participates as well. But the family nation politics of Republican boundary drawing seems to me to actually put welfare nationalism, populism, racism, anti-gender politics, all together in a kind of uh, demographic, national, or um, anti-democratic uh, worldview. People should not, in fact, have equal rights. Good people should have equal rights, and good people are the people who are not parts of these various minority groups or hold these opinions. And you're getting much more explicitly anti-democratic discourse from Republican strategists and from even Republican politicians who are saying, you know, I don't really believe in democracy um, because I don't believe that everybody uh, has equal information or should have an equal voice. So where's all this anti-democratic? version of populism coming from and why is it so tied up with gender? So, Thanks so much, Myra. These strains have always been present in the Republican Party. If you go back to the 1990s, you see them complaining about, um, you know, we should have people um, show their IDs at the polls, you know, so, so these strains have always been there, right? But the question of why are some of these strains being privileged over others? Um, and in my book, what I could do is I had this, you know, massive archival record, so I could actually trace how they were talking about um, should we focus on this, should we push this, should we push that, and 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 what happens, and the sort of um, sort of uh, institutional and other things that happen. Um, so one of the things, for example, that promoted tax cuts to the top of the agenda was uh, the Proposition 13 reform in California, um, which seemed to uh, show the potential popularity of tax cuts, right? Um, and so this pushes tax cuts uh, kind of, uh, to everyone's attention as a thing that they can focus on. If I had that kind of archival material, um, that's what I would you know, try to see. Why do, you know, say you've got, um, you've got gender issues, you've got voting rights issues, you've got um, opposition to gun control, all of these various things, um, and how are Republicans talking about um, what's going to be the um, the, the, the thing that uh, they're really focused on. The real puzzle for me is why they aren't focusing more on opposition to gun control, given how much their base wants this. Um, and I actually think that this is, um, this is Proposition 13 in reverse, that um, you know, any Republican politician who really pushes this is going to be vulnerable every time there's a shooting. Um, so I do think that that's, there's a sort of um, reason why they're kind of constraining themselves on, 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 on that issue. Um, yeah, I, I also, if we can really examine the kind of process of ideological innovation within the Republican Party, um, you know, I think what we would see is that they're sort of throwing a lot out and seeing what sticks. You know, so um, this uh, parents' rights thing is sticking. Transgender seems to be sticking a little bit. Um, this uh, voting rights thing they seem to seem to um, seems to be sticking. Um, uh, yeah, so. You actually you put your finger on exactly what the weakest part of the paper is, which is I don't really have a good a good answer to to, to that question, but um, it is something that I um, am working on and thinking about. Um, you know what what kinds of institutional 
um, factors channel attention one way rather than another. For instance, for example, with the the Brexit issue. Um, I was just uh, I heard something you said about the Iraq War. Um, so it's kind of like a a response in the question because what I said was, and yet you'll now find almost nobody would say the Iraq War was a good idea, and that was one factor in the rise of Trump, who was able to portray himself at least as more anti-war. And while it was popular at a certain point uh, early on after it was launched, uh, I'd say, um, notwithstanding that there was an unprecedented anti-war movement before it started, and the distinction between the Iraq War and the wider War on Terror, which post 9-11 was obviously far more organically popular, surely that popularity can't be separated from a media blitz used to sell it to the public. And latterly, the feeling that we had to support the troops since the war had begun. So launching it, and I hope I heard this right, otherwise I might have seen <laughs> responding to uh, it might, this might all be a moot point. But uh, framing it as responsiveness to public opinion, I feel gets things the wrong way around because it was obviously more to the way I could see it about um, uh, the framing of public opinion itself in that, uh, I guess, Trumpskian way and has since come undone, especially on, on the issue of Iraq. Um, so, yeah, something can be popular. It doesn't mean it's necessarily coming from the masses and the politicians are just uh, responding um, in a good democratic way. Yeah, no, you heard it correctly. And it's a fascinating and important question that leads to this huge question in democratic theory. Uh, so um, the um, so we were having this discussion. The reason we got into that issue was uh, we asked um, someone asked, uh, well, isn't aren't politicians less responsive to people? Um, so if we are just asking the question, are they responding to the people, to what the people want? They definitely are doing that. If that's your definition of democracy, are politicians responsive to people? They were doing that for the Iraq War. They were, you know, what people wanted matched what the politicians did. You're asking a different question, which is why do people want the things they want? And what role do politicians have in, um, in creating that desire? So um, Martin Gillens uh, in the, the, the book that I was referring to that shows responsiveness, um, he kind of argues uh, that um, you've got to, um, you, you have to um, respect people's beliefs if you want a democracy, however they get to what they want. If you want democratic responsiveness, you've got to respond to what they want. Um, and uh, so these are, um, these are two separate questions. Um, are the politicians doing what the people want and why do the people want what they want? Um, so um, this question is super interesting, um, especially on the issue of tax cuts, because there is this question of, um, on tax cuts, I think even more than for the Iraq war, there definitely was this, uh, this, pol this politicians defining how we're going to do this because you know as i said they didn't actually want tax cuts at the expense of um deficit spending so therefore what republicans did is push this argument that we are going to give you tax cuts without deficit spending so we're going to give you exactly what you want they couldn't do this and the whole thing unspooled from you know from there but um you know so we can um if, if, if we want to, the reason I want to separate this out into two different questions, are politicians responding to, responding to voters and what do voters want, is that addressing whether, whether what voters want is accurate or worthy of respect uh, is a really hard question you have to establish certain criteria saying, well, this is what the voters preference is, but I'm not going to allow it. Um, so, uh, I mean, it certainly can be the case, uh, mistakes happen, right? Um, but actually saying, well, this is a false preference 
is a really hard thing to do analytically. So that's why I want to separate those two questions. Thank you so much for that, Ian. I guess, uh, Monica, I'll ask a, a small question that somewhat related to just, uh, I think, to your response just now. Um, in your research, have you seen any daylight between the notion of um, personal or individual tax cuts being a salient um, motivator of voters compared to corporate tax cuts, um, particularly in the time frame uh, from 81 uh, to now. I was really struck by one of your measures um, where uh, it was examining uh, the notion of competition and the way in which it had its um, apex um, and is now um, is now slowly moving towards uh, a measure that suggests that actually competition is a good idea, which one could I guess, feasibly interpret as um, a, an understanding that uh, concentration or monopoly is actually not good for working people. And it's not good, per perhaps, for an economy that that works well. And I obviously think about the tech sector when I think about that orientation. So I'm curious, in your data, are you seeing that? What do you think is going on there? Um, is, is there any difference at all? Corporate tax cuts have never been popular. So and um... And tax cuts for the wealthy, if you say it that way, are not popular. Um, and that's been the case, you know, always. Um, so on the other hand, if you give a policy that is largely tax cuts for the wealthy, but also includes some tax cuts for the poor, which is what George W. Bush's policy was, that's remarkably popular. Um, and, you know, and again, this goes into the question of false consciousness or preferences, um, because what was happening there is that um, people were seeing this tax cut in their check, were very happy about it, um, were not necessarily seeing exactly what was going to the wealthy. Um, people did, if you look at polls, they did know that the tax cut was skewed towards the wealthy, um, but it didn't really seem to uh, dislodge the preference there. So, um, yeah, so your question about uh, corporations, I mean, this has been true throughout, and this is why um, uh, Democrats are always able to use this tax, the tax the wealthy to kind of um, get back into it. Um, and Republicans uh, have to cut taxes on everyone instead of just saying we're going to cut taxes on the, on the wealthy, which, by the way, also actually begins, it's the Democrats back in the 1980s who first suggested we're going to cut taxes for the, um, for the, we're going to cut the top tax rate. It wasn't actually Republicans, but that's a whole other question. So we look forward to you pursuing that in an additional paper, but we are nearing time. So on behalf of the Havens Wright Center for Social Justice and the Department of History at UW-Madison, I would like to extend our deep thanks to Monica Prasad for a really excellent presentation and a thoughtful discussion. And to you, our audience, we hope to see you again very soon. Until then, be well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.